Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And we are very pleased to have this uh, community meeting, uh, which is both local and national in character. And uh, it is not fully hybrid because people far away won't be able to see, um, but they will be able to listen and see people's faces and that's partly live. And some of you have come a uh, little ways to get here, and that's very much appreciated. And we don't take it for granted. New Mexico is full of geography. Yes. <laughs> there are bathrooms straight that way through the hall. Uh, we'll have approximately a two hour program, uh, and it will be as follows uh, I will introduce the meeting. Trish will help me remember things, but I forget them. Uh, I will uh, speak first, then um, uh, then Steve Starr, who is on our board of directors, uh, formerly senior scientist with the positions for social responsibility, um, director of the clinical program in the University of Missouri, um, head of our hospital blood lab for a long time, um, a data uh, person trained at Fidelity to Data, which we like. Um, followed by uh, Peter Kuznick at American University, um, whose bio you saw. Peter is um, very much a man now. Um, and and uh, he runs uh, what is called Nuclear. Institute, Nuclear Studies Institute, or something like that at our university. And he has been working with people in this country and abroad on nuclear issues. And lately, he is everywhere on international media and in talk shows in Russia, in India, and in China as an authority on the US uh, on nuclear weapons and international relations. Um, this, uh, Dieter mentioned that, that what really uh, brought this about was his role as the uh, collaborator with Oliver Stone in a very fine um, series uh, on um, Untold History. The Untold History of the United States, which I highly recommend for anybody who's students or adults. And then we will also have at the very present a practical, a little bit practical discussion about um, where we can go uh, here in Mexico uh, because we have a very unique opportunity here, uh, which we'll hear about more. And I would like to introduce uh, my partner, Trish Williams Mello, who is pretty much the backbone of our organization. Um, and um, Bex. Hampton and Jesse Smith, who are part-time scholar organizers, who are amplifying everything that we do and many things we could never have done without them. So we're for sure. That's us now, and uh, and as well as our board directors, some of whom may be on, on Zoom, certainly Steve. So with that, I better get started. You'll have to share screen. Yeah, I'll have to share screens. Good. Yes. Our there it is. topic tonight uh, is a new report uh, produced that is. The authors hope that, as well as people behind the scenes and people in front of the curtain, such as the Senate Armed Services Committee and, and many members of the House Armed Services Committee, um, hope will be a pivot for a more aggressive nuclear strategy for the United States. Uh, this is the, uh, it's not the first time a congressional commission has been put together to uh, make recommendations. Here is their report. 
Um, it's fairly thick, but about three fourths of it is repetitive. Um, and it's very badly written as far as English goes. Of course, the people on Zoom cannot see that. Uh, the people on Zoom cannot see that, but perhaps they can see it that way, right? Anyway, no, you're sharing your screen. Sorry. Yeah. And I'm sharing your screen. Uh, there's some piece. Yeah, there it is. Bex is showing it. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. Um, there you go. Thanks, Bex. Um, we have some handouts which show a few of the um, only a few, only a few. Uh, just did you possibly put these things in the aisles? Maybe not that. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the um, this is an aggressive report. And it's uh it doesn't look right. Nice. Okay, yeah, camera. Uh there. You kept turning your camera off and on. Yeah, well, all right, that to be just by here. Uh, it's uh, yeah, and our uh, risk it just uh, um, risk some feedback. When it's that your posture, just the first thing I thought of. And wait, oh, oh, hold on, the right and left. Yeah, I know, but it, we're, it is now. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, so this is a posture which uh, is really appropriate for this report. And I'm sorry if this is a little irreverent here, uh, but this report is the most aggressive hawkish report that I have seen in 30 years of mostly full time work on nuclear policy. Uh, so we dug up a 1982 cartoon from uh, Trevor of the Albuquerque Journal, who uh, was himself a missile officer in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, I figure he got out of the draft at um, the end of by Joe McNutt. Mm -hmm. uh, Trevor was quite good. And yes, uh, always fighting the last war. Um, so this, you know, this is really the flavor of this. This report um, harkens back to the Reagan administration in its worst days. Um, now, this is also something that's a little crude on my part. Um, we know some of the authors of this report. We know them personally, and we're disappointed in them. Um, and as the benefit excuse me, Eli Clinton and Ben Freeman said, about three fourths of the authors of this report are lobbyists. And I haven't checked, maybe more. Um, this whole business is about money. And it, I was just motivated to write this slide. I, I go to meetings of nuclear contractors. I've been to um, 15, maybe, maybe 20. And there are, it's all about money, really. Uh, I mean, there's this year of patriotism, but if you took away the, the very good money, you would have nothing. Um, most people don't know that the US nuclear weapons establishment is more than 97% privatized. This is not primarily a federal activity. It just looks federal on the surface. It's for profit. Now, we have nonprofit contractor here at Los Alamos, but the profit goes to the senior executives. So already 15 years ago, the lab director was making about a million and a half a year. I imagine he's making well over two million a year. The bonuses for senior people are going to be uh, in the six figures or at least high um, five figures. Excuse me, six figures. Excuse me, five figures or high four figures. That's how the mission uh, priorities are moved down the chain of command um, by motivating those senior executives to get shit done. Sorry, but that's how it is. Uh, the contractors have little or no capital at risk and they are indemnified under the Price Anderson Act. 
The contracts are huge, among the largest contracts in the federal government. So Los Alamos contract many years ago was worth 35 billion. And because you think about it, it's um, almost 5 billion this year. The contracts run for many years, and that's what they're worth. Um, and of course, there's uh, some contractors will also, you know, if you do some difficult work for the federal government, you may get another contract. So, for example, the nuclear fuel from the submarines or so on. I have to be really quick with this. So the rec this report says that we need a whole new strategic posture because Russia and China are being too aggressive. And they are competing with us and they're undermining the post-Cold War international order, which means our U.S. domination. One is a nuclear peer and the other is going to be soon if it continues. Our own strategic forces face problems. That's very important. Workforce shortages, supply chain limitations, inadequate infrastructures of all kinds. So their number one recommendation was to eliminate opposition within the government and accountability within the government. So they want an entire government, which is in consensus agreement about a hawkish nuclear policy. We did not have that under the Reagan years, if you recall. Um, the this will be akin to flying man to the moon. And they say that the state governments also have to be harnessed to help with this nuclear weapons mission. Uh, not only do they, they say the U.S. is not leading anymore, but we're not even keeping up. So China and Russia especially have hypersonic missile we don't. Our, our tests fail. Um, Russia has other advanced nuclear weapons that we don't have. China has carrier killer missiles we can't stop. Um, the and it, and there are anti satellite weapons over there which um, we don't can't do anything about. We have an existing modernization program which many of us have been decrying for many years, but. So they say you've got to execute this very quickly, but that won't be enough. You need much more. So the critical time frame for action is 27 to 35, because by 35, China would be about equal to us in the number of nuclear warheads you could throw. No cost analysis was done. And they don't have a consensus, despite what they said in uh, the Senate hearing we watched. And they say, if the U.S. cannot deter and defeat Russia and China simultaneously with conventional weapons, which is ridiculous, we'll have to rely more on nuclear weapons. So there's no if in that, uh, in reality. Just, um, they say that nuclear weapons can be legally used. And they put the parameters down for the legal use of nuclear weapons. Um, we need to have more kinds of tactical nuclear weapons than we do, they say. And we need to base them uh, in the Pacific uh, theater. And we have to expand all the infrastructure to build all this. We have to hedge against failures, delays, strategic inadequacies. Uh, the regular program we have now is likely to stumble. Um, we know this, everybody knows this. And we have to start um, technical and vocational training amp it up to supply the necessary skilled trades because the United States has the industrial itself in the rush to export our industries to China. We need large conventional global strike forces. That means conventional missiles which can go around the world and take out China. Um, uh, missile defenses, space warfare assets, and we want to fight our wars in other countries, of course, in this country. Um, as uh, Netanyahu and Zelensky have uh, been recently said, we're your, if we fall, then it's your weakness. Um, arms control, we will only do if it benefits us in our objectives of, frankly, domination. I mean, that's, that's my word. They don't use that word. They use, uh, they, they don't want these other powers to compete with us. I don't know. There is an eight simpler English word. 
there, which is astonishing. Um, the we have two R two nuclear arsenals. One is deployed. One is in reserve. They would like the United States to put those reserve warheads on missiles as, uh, as soon as possible. Get ready to do it. We can't do it under the New Start Treaty, which expires on February twenty sixth. But we could do it after that. We have to con. Uh, so they want to increase various. Uh, numbers of very expensive things, um, very provocative. Uh, they want to uh, put uh, ICBMs in uh, trucks uh, so they can move around the country, at least part of the country. They want to put bombers on continuous alert, like in the Cold War. Um, they want to practice uploading the warheads. In other words, prepare to break the New START Treaty so that Russia will see that and so Russia will do that and then we'll all throw the treaty. And the same for the second bullet, reconvert the submarine um, launch ballistic missile launchers that were converted away from being active, that were arrested, already complained that this could be done, that they could be reconverted back to missile launchers. And we'll just prove them right if we do it. And B-52s, Russia has said the same thing. And, um, Let's see, we already talked about developing and deploying theater nuclear weapons that are survivable from low yield to high yield, penetrate air defenses, arrive very quickly so that the our enemies won't have any enough warning, which means that they'll be on air trigger alert. We'll have to, the infrastructure that's being planned is too small, including pit production facilities, and it's all too slow. And we have to pull out all the stops. That means Get rid of red tape, safety regulations, uh, the steps that have been put in there to achieve greater accountability for construction projects and line items. And they have a lot of recommendations as to how to do that because the head of this commission is super knowledgeable about all that. And making the weapons the highest official priority of the Department of Energy, not just the de facto highest priority. And they offer some structural suggestions to make the nuclear weapons establishment more powerful in relation to civilian government. And finally, I just uh, they note that the biological weapons convention is not working. Well, they should know. Um, so I have to leave that topic. It's a very important topic um, because um, NNSA would like has tried to build a biological facility in Santa. And um, was negotiating with a local realtor whom we know, who owned the facility. And the negotiator said, Well, we're going to we're going to look at Rio Ranch. The Senate is um, not warranted. <laughs> so, what is the program of record that is, uh, that they say is not adequate? Replacing or upgrading every single thing is what uh, the Obama administration was forced to do by the Senator Kyle, who was the co-author of this report, and it fellow Republicans in the Senate. Um, we have some of the few handouts. We can make a lot of copies of everything, but you can find them on our website, and we'll post these slides so you can go use the links. Uh, since the, so the existing program of record was hammered out in 2010 under Obama, just that open the door to uh, ratifying the uh, New START Treaty, and uh, which takes two-thirds vote in the Senate, so it became difficult. Uh, so it's changed since then. The pit production has been the most difficult of all, um, thanks to people like us, a uh, few people. Uh, some of them are in this group, and um, they have been um, they put pinned all their hopes on pit production of Osalmos, and that has now failed four times or five times if you include the present effort, which has already failed by any normal business uh, frame of reference. So then they came up, you know, they tried this other thing, uh, pit production underground modules where you have like, you know, dwarves working underground and uh, like, uh, Anyway, uh, like Tolkien or something, and uh, GAO said, no, 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 no. 
and that's not going to work for various reasons. And so now their new plan is two factories, not just one factory, twice the money for the same product. Um, and uh, because they, because the new larger new facility at uh, the Savannah Riverside won't be ready in time to produce even, well, it won't start until 2035. So all new warheads with new pits that are to be produced will need warhead cores or pits, which are made here in the greater Santa Fe area. Um, and these are some of the other changes that have taken place since 2010, mostly expanding the uh, program of record. And uh, the rest are all more or less expansions. And then there's some other expansions that are still being debated. Um, and here's one of them that just came out just very recently. Um, it, it's from the management perspective, it's minor. Um, it, uh, you know, we talked about it uh, this afternoon, the gas emissions got, but it's a, it's a large, uh, high yield uh, bomb drops to airplanes. And it's a modification of an existing one, but it'll be much more accurate and it'll be integrated with uh, modern airplanes. And this is saying we'll provide the president with additional options. Um, it's difficult for them to say, as they have said in the past, we it's not a new weapon, it doesn't change anything. Now they don't say that anymore. Now they say it changes everything. It does change things. Um, so that's a very big difference in the rhetoric, and we are supposed to get used to that. Now, what else has changed? Uh, one thing that's changing is the price point. So uh, let's see, got a place we can. Yeah, ta da. Uh, 2010 is there. It took a few years for these projects to get off the ground. Those are dollars. The top of that graph is 25 billion a year just for warheads. This is just the warhead part of it. And these are constant dollars uh, corrected uh, with the um, consumer price index. Um, and the, those, the oldest year on here is 1948. And you can see that, that during the high cold war and cost of dollars, we were not spending anywhere near this much money on nuclear warheads. Um, it is gradual democratic group. So here we got this proposal, and it's been warmly received in the Senate. It um, it will be fought over, but with what success? They Politically, by positing these enormous increases in uh, nuclear spending and nuclearization of our own forces and our entire strategic posture, they make the present aggressive program look reasonable. And so they move the center of gravity of the debate. And now you have to be, you know, um, Putin's BFF to say that you don't want a rock on flats in your backyard. Well, it makes it very difficult for people in Congress to say, no, I don't, I think we could wait. We don't need to make pits right now. There's nothing wrong with the existing pits. Um, and then, you know, are you a communist? Or, you know what? Um, so we have a serious problem in Congress. I just got back from Washington. And uh, it's a very strange place now. Um, I call it a war set was, was uh, in motion there. And um, we we have to map out saner alternatives. One of which, the obvious one, for is to wait until pits are needed. Um, build in the time for building the facility. Build in everything that the same person would say, <clears throat> but don't do gratuitous work. Just to posture more aggressive. And we could talk all night and into the morning about hits and why um, we don't need them. Um, but uh, what has happened is that we are now in a very adversarial relationship with Russia. It is not just with Putin. Putin is on the, I would say, dumbish, but rational, uh, maybe dumbish, 
the in a poll, he the the majority of criticism that was expressed in this uh, from citizens of Putin is that he's not aggressive enough in international relations. So people he's he's criticized more for being soft on the West than hard. Uh, and the um, the Russians, well, but Cousin Peter is going to talk about all this, and so possibly Steve as well. So I don't want to talk too much about this. But even absent war, this is fantastically expensive. And it implies a military budget and a nuclear budget, which will dwarf what we have now. As such, uh, it will be very difficult to maintain a viable society here, deal with any of the problems we have, or pay our rapidly exponentially rising um, debt payments on, on uh, fifth debt. Um, I ran out of time this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to leave that. Um, and I think I should leave this very detailed chart about some people say that uh, the requirements for pitch have actually changed a lot under Trump. And uh, this is just a further explanation of the program record. No, they didn't. They have uh, been more or less constant for a long time. Um, and perhaps I just uh, in there, I'm out of time. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we, I just want to reiterate that this, that are standard already, this is a proposal which can be defeated. Um, the federal government is not the highest authority of this planet. There are other governments, there are um, relatively immutable laws which the federal government has followed, and then there is the human conscience. They need willing workers. They need a lot of things to go right for them. They are hard against material and social and moral limits in this society. They're pushing hard against them. That is why they have failed before. They haven't been able to surmount the material problems. Um, as Lindy said at, at lunch, reminded us all, the Lanel, as an institution, has burdened all reasonable scale for its site and for the region. They don't know where to, they don't know how to get people to work, where to house them, where to put them in offices. Um, I mean, it's, it would be funny if it weren't, and no one, no one in, in a normal business would do anything like that. And uh, that's just a uh, detail. So, I think we have time for just one or two, like really quick clarifying questions before we give the floor to Steve. And we might need to use the mic so that people online can hear. Oh, you see the mic, yes. Yes, can you all come up to come up to the mic, please? I thought the Republicans were against raising the deficit. What do they think about this? That's a great question. Um, we are going to find allies in strange places. And we have the good things. And yes. exactly right. Yep. Um, and they're, they're so um, And this is one of those um, things which, um, I mean, we may win for reasons that have nothing to do with policy. This is not a normal situation. Anyone else? Hang on, let's get you up on the mic first. You mentioned theater nuclear. What is a theater nuclear? Theater weapon is a nuclear weapon which is deployed in a regional war like Ukraine or Taiwan. Okay, should we go on to Steve? Let's go on, Steve. Um, are you there, Steve? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just I'm having trouble hearing the questions from the audience. So I apologize. I just it's not coming through. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
You want me to go ahead and start my presentation? Absolutely, Steve. Please. Okay. Okay, well, <clears throat> Greg sent a pretty good introduction of the uh, Congressional Commission report that, and, and I understood that was really what he wanted me to at least partially discuss. Um, I think my title port is planning for doomsday <laughs> because, you know, really, um, the people that would put together a plan like this are either truly evil or they're just incredibly ignorant, or maybe both. I don't know. I like oh, the, the quote that uh, Greg had was, hell is empty <laughs> and all the devils are here, you know, from Shakespeare, I think. But, you know, these people think they can win a nuclear war. Um, you know, the, the wording that Greg quoted was that they wanted to be able to deter and defeat uh, American enemies with nuclear weapons. So there's no doubt about uh, what their intentions are. And I, I, I highlighted some of these. I don't have long, detailed slides, but, um, you know, that the report recommends that the U.S. replace all U.S. nuclear delivery systems. Um, I got background noise. I'm not sure. Um, okay. And... And not only replace the nuclear delivery systems, but modernize all the U.S. nuclear warheads. So that means we need all new missiles, all new warheads. <laughs> um, and they, they want us to comprehensively modernize U.S. nuclear command control and communication systems. And also to modify the U.S. strategic nuclear force to address a larger number of targets, which means increase the number of nuclear weapons. So they want to re replace them all. And then when they, when they replace them, they want to have all new more nuclear warheads because we have more targets um, in order to increase the number of warheads they want to upload some or all the nation's hedge and a hedge is kind of a euphemism for the number of nuclear warheads that the u.s and russia keep uh, ready to be deployed which in this case is about 1,900 to 2,000 nuclear warheads on each side which is more than doubling because we have about 1,670 or 1,700 deployed nuclear warheads. And Russia is about the same. So if if the U.S. and Russia were to upload and deploy all these hedge weapons, we would have something like 7,000 deployed and operational nuclear weapons ready to start a nuclear war. And they want us to deploy these in MIRV configuration on the ICBMs, increase the long, uh, number of deployed long-range standoff weapons, which is the long-range nuclear weapons. Um, Increase the planned number of B-21 bombers. Increase everything, right? <clears throat> and increase the planned production of the new uh, Columbia nuclear ballistic missile submarines and their Trident ballistic missiles. And make sure that some portion of the future ICBM force is a road mobile configuration. Uh, and finally, they want to make sure that the future bomber force needs to be on continuous alert status. <laughs> so... Um, Meanwhile, that's what they tell us we need. I thought I'd just get a few slides of what they tell us, you know, how to be prepared for a nuclear war. This is a slide from a FEMA presentation in New York City. And, you know, they say, well, first you need to get inside and then stay inside and stay tuned for your um, updates about what's happened after the nuclear war starts and nuclear bomb goes off in your city. <laughs> and um, Los Alamos is doing its part, too. They had a... a video presentation they had on the nuke resistant city. So um, so that's what they're telling us. I mean, maybe that's what they think. I, I don't know what these people think anymore, but the bombs that they have on those uh, morning videos and presentations are roughly about the size of the Hiroshima size bomb. They, they refer to them in the past as terrorist oh, weapons. So this would be about 15,000 tons of TNT, which is like not a minor explosive. But it would set about four square miles on fire. That's what the bomb at Hiroshima did on an average weather day, clear weather. Well, the thermal nuclear weapons that we have in our arsenal in Russia does can set up to 150 square miles. Uh, the, the Russian uh, 800 kiloton weapon, they have about 350 of those at launch ready status, can set 150 square miles on fire on a normal day. Um, and this is a picture of what a shadow was left on a sidewalk from a, the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. A person was sitting there, they were vaporized. So it's, it's like a piece of the sun. The temperature on the surface of the fireball is hotter than the surface of the sun. And this is what four square miles of Hiroshima looked like after the atomic bomb went off about six months later. So 
what happens? Um, I'm, I just want to. I'm going to explain briefly. I know a lot of y'all are pretty well educated, but there may be somebody that doesn't. We don't get this information in schools. My students never understand it. A nuclear fireball will set fires simultaneously over tens or hundreds of square miles, and within a, tens of minutes, all the fires will merge into one gigantic fire, a nuclear firestorm. And the air temperatures in this firestorm are well above the boiling point of water, uh, and nothing's going to survive in that fire zone. So that fire zone that I showed you, 100 square miles, is everything in it's going to be completely burned up. Now, if you had 100 atomic bombs that were detonated in large cities, the scientists have figured out that it would put about 5 to 7 million tons of soot into the stratosphere above cloud level where it can't be rained out. It would, ra it would remain there for up to a decade. And, um, you know, it would cause, it would block 7 to 10 percent of the sunlight from reaching the surface of the earth and create the coldest average weather conditions in uh, the last thousand years. It would also destroy the protective ozone layer. You could get a sunburn in about seven minutes instead of a half an hour and, and noon. And this is uh, shows a picture of what the ozone would happen after a, there's a regional nuclear or 100 atomic bombs. And this is um, an image of a farmer in a field looking up at the sky. It's a clear sky, but that's what the sky would look like with a, a cloudless sky at noon with a 10% loss of sunlight. <clears throat> so um, where am I getting this information from? Well, these were peer-reviewed studies that were initially done in the 1980s, but they were revised and began published in 2007. There's a list of studies here. They go all the way through 2022. But apparently the people that write these studies uh, about the, in the Congress have no idea about any of this. Uh, I wrote an article, even in, this was in 2017, actually 2016, it was originally published by the Federation of American Scientists. Now they removed it from their website because I think it probably isn't politically correct. But what I was saying was that none of the leaders of the nuclear weapon states, including the, those in the United States, um, have accepted the nuclear winter research. You know, I had a very good friend in Los Alamos that told me that uh, he was quite sure that uh, this, this information had been rejected by the people that, that make the decisions. So, what does that mean? That means we have these idiots, you know, making plans that go crazy. Well, a war that's fought with 4,000 nuclear weapons, not the 7,000 that I say that we will have if we upload all the hedge stockpiles. This is what the scientists predicted. They figured it would create 150 to 180 million tons of soot. And the black carbon soot is, um, you know, it's a great way to absorb sunlight. It rises up into the stratosphere above cloud level where it can't be rained out. And it only takes a couple of weeks for it to circle around the earth. And then they figure that it would block sunlight for up to 10 years, 70% in the Northern hemisphere, 35% in the Southern. And every day for up to two to three years, it would be below freezing in central North America and central Eurasia. So, and then it would be impossible to grow crops after that. This is uh, an image of what the sky would look like at noon. Um, so, <clears throat> You know, this when I first saw this back in 2006 and seven, I that's when I first met Greg. I was uh, I was going to the United Nations and I went to a conference actually in Washington, D.C. and met Greg. <laughs> and then I wound up at the U.N. I got a grant to speak. But I, I started putting this information out and I was able to give a, a presentation of the General Assembly. Well, actually, the first committee, but it's about the same thing in 2010. So this information has been out there like that for 13 years. This is a slide that the scientists sent me just from recently. Their, their latest studies, believe they believe at least um, you know more than about 5.3 billion people would die after a war, like I described. So, you know, it's because there is some attenuation of the smoke. But do we really want to do that? I mean, do you think deterrence will work perfectly forever? So my recommendations are that we need to reverse the commission recommendations, for, and we have, need to have less, not more, nuclear weapons. We stop the flow of money for weapons and war and spend it to address human needs. Maybe we wouldn't have people living in the sidewalks that they have to hide when the Chinese come over. Uh, and the endless wars for hegemony. I mean, it, all of these wars that are being fought are created with color, loose, crap, color revolutions and military intervention, and interventions that are designed to create chaos in societies. Divide and conquer has been the rule ever since the Romans were in power. And, and you know, we haven't changed it, only now that we have the technology to blow up most of the planet, it's a little different. But we could use this power to make the earth into a paradise. We really could. We don't have to have hunger, poverty. We could abolish all of it. We still need to spend a trillion dollars a year on military budgets. And we certainly don't need to build any more plutonium pit factories. And 
I want to say I meant to say at the beginning that you know I've admired Greg and Trish for a long time because they're I think they're the only people I know that really they they stopped the, the pit factory from being built in Los Alamos some time ago. You stop the pitch, you stop the production of nuclear weapons. So um, thank you for that. And at any rate, um, I, I and if you don't mind, I want to. I have one more slide. I just published a book uh, on nuclear high altitude electromagnetic pulse. <laughs> My publisher told me I got to tell people about it every time I give a talk, but it's available on Amazon. And this, you know, one nuclear weapon can wipe out our entire electric grid you detonate even over the if you detonated a nuclear weapon over the yucatan peninsula it would bring the whole grid down in the u.s it would destroy most of the large power transformers and we would be without electricity for up to a year or longer and then it would also cause most of the you know a couple dozen nuclear power plants to melt down at the same time so on that cheery note uh, i'm going to stop I, i'm glad peter's after me because he's he's very well spoken and um uh, i'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Okay. Um, now have time for a couple questions, or um, before we we go on to Dr. Kuzmi. Uh, yes. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, like I said, listen. Uh, yeah. Um, you will. We'll look into each other's eyes, and we'll. Say we're going to stop this. We're going to stop it. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to say something about um, the last couple of things that uh, Stephen said. There is this, uh, just to amplify, there's, there's an idea that nuclear war can be controlled and that uh, this number of weapons will do that. What Steve said was one nuclear weapon could take down the U.S. strict. Everyone, pretty much everyone dies when the grid goes down. And this is not a US war plan. This is not in the thinking of these people who wrote this report or in the Court of record in any way. Well, we are, yeah, that's all, that's all it was. Um, Peter, are you, yes, you are, I see you. Uh, are you prepared to uh, tell us uh, how this report is likely to be seen uh, overseas as well as any other insights you may wish to offer? Uh, I'll give it a try. I've got a, a few things I wanted to say. Uh, first, uh, the, one of the questions is, why are the Chinese building up their nuclear capabilities as rapidly as they are. And that's something that's been misunderstood. But there was a very good article recently in Foreign Affairs, the publication of the Council on Foreign Relations, not usually the place we would look to for insider wisdom on this kind of matter. And what they explained there it's an article titled, China's Misunderstood Nuclear Expansion, How U.S. Strategy is Fueling Beijing's Growing Arsenal. Uh, and what they explain there is that the Chinese buildup is largely in response to U.S. policy. Uh, that the U.S., according to the Chinese fear, is undermining its ability to hit back with a second strike. We know that China uh, two years ago had about 200 nuclear weapons. Last year, they had 400 nuclear weapons. The estimate now is that they already have 500 nuclear weapons. By the end of the decade, likely to have 1,000. By 2035, likely to have 1,500. So the question is, why are they building this up like this? And the, the understanding that, that I've gotten from foreign affairs and other sources is that uh, beginning with uh, Donald Trump's 2018 nuclear posture review, the United States, not number one, lowered the threshold for use of nuclear weapons and dramatically increased the number of nuclear weapons. 
the Chinese were concerned that this would negate China's ability to strike back if China was hit. Uh, and so the Chinese response, they're arguing, is not an irrational or aggressive response. It's a rational attempt to maintain a nuclear deterrent that has some credibility. Now, if we look, for example, at some of the comments that have been made by Chinese experts recently, uh, the uh, Chinese arms control expert, Li Bin, says that uh, the uh, nuclear posture review of 2018 suggests that the United States would use its nuclear weapons to respond to non-nuclear Chinese aggressions. The other thing that the Chinese are, are concerned about is that if there is a war between the U.S. and China over Taiwan, the U.S. is likely to resort to nuclear weapons. We know that the Pentagon has run 18 war games over a war between the U.S. and China over Taiwan, and that China has won all 18 war games run by the Pentagon. And so the concern by Chinese experts, uh, I can go through a bunch of them. Uh, Liu Ji- spotlighted him for everyone. What was that? You're fine. Sorry, okay. Peter. Uh, I hear some background like Stephen was, so I'm not sure that everybody can hear me. Um, uh, Liu Ji, uh, who is a, an expert for the People's Liberation Army, said China cannot refrain from being concerned about the possibility of U.S. nuclear first use in a regional crisis. A retired Chinese general, Pan Zhengqiang, said... Uh, that China must contemplate a war scenario which the U.S. may launch a nuclear attack, perhaps in a conflict over the Taiwan Strait. I mean, I've got a bunch more of these. The Chinese really are concerned, number one, that the U.S. can knock out its capability to respond with a nuclear second strike. And number two, that the U.S. would preemptively use nuclear weapons if there is such a confrontation. I'm going to get into some more related to that in a minute. But Greg asked me to talk about the international response to the uh, strategic uh, the uh, the uh, commission report and interesting response in task uh, titled "U.S. Behavior Regarding Strategic Dialogue Matters." looks like a bipolar disorder. The, the task response was that the United States is having a mental breakdown. And they wrote on November 9th, US behavior in the strategic stability dialogue looks pretty much like what often happens in cases of bipolar disorder. Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Rabkov has said, quote, the Americans are notorious for their dual approaches. There can simultaneously coexist both fundamental denial of certain realities, which no matter how much they may postulate, the opposite are still observed regardless of their will, and at the same time attempt to influence this very reality. In other words, to eliminate it or change it somehow. Uh, Ryapkov said in an interview, I believe that this is a manifestation of bipolarity, not in the geopolitical sense that I've said in the Cold War era, but a brain problem. If you don't mind my saying so, I think that what they really need is to reorganize themselves a little bit somehow and look at themselves more sensibly and soberly before we'll be able to discuss something like this with them substantively. Uh, the response from the Chinese Communist Party publication, China Daily. They said, uh, the worst and paradoxically tragic part of the whole warmongering exercise is that the report was released on a website called the United States Institute of Peace, which claims to be, quote, dedicated to the proposition that a world without violent conflict is possible. Maybe this is ridiculous fact, that maybe this ridiculous fact best explains how the U.S. interprets peace, conquest or threat of conquest, so as to build a global system in which everyone obeys it as the only superpower. I also have a response from North Korea, which was carried by Press TV 
in Tehran. Uh, there they quote Kim Kwang Myung, a researcher at the Foreign Ministries Institute for Disarmament and Peace. And Kim says, quote, the, US, the U.S., the world's biggest nuclear weapon state and the world's first nuclear user, which adopted the preemptive nuclear attack on other countries as its national policy, is talking about a nuclear threat from someone. This is sophism. The reality urgently requires the DPRK, which is standing in confrontation with the U.S. imperialism, the most aggressive nuclear war criminal force, to bolster up its self-defense military capabilities for deterring a nuclear war. Uh, it goes on, uh, and I'll, I'll get to some of that. So the North Korean response is that they have to respond to the U.S. nuclear buildup by building up their own nuclear capabilities. The uh, Seaside Daily, an Indian daily based in the city of Hyderabad, uh, had an interesting response also. Uh, they said, uh, the Strategic Posture, Posture Commission report is a full-throated embrace of a U.S. nuclear buildup. It includes recommendations for the U.S. to prepare to increase its number of deployed warheads as well as increases production of bombers, air launch cruise missiles, ballistic missile submarines, non-strategic nuclear forces, and warhead production capacity. It also calls for the U.S. to deploy multiple warheads on land-based intercontinental missiles and consider adding road mobile ICBMs to its arsenal. The only thing that appears to have prevented the commission from recommending an immediate increase of the U.S. nuclear weapons stockpile is that the weapons production complex currently doesn't have the capacity to do so. The commission's embrace of a U.S. nuclear buildup ignores the consequences of a likely arms race, race with Russia and China. In fact, the commission doesn't even consider this or suggests other steps in a buildup to try to address the problem. If the U.S. responds to the Chinese buildup by increasing its own deployed warheads and launchers, Russia would most likely respond by increasing its deployed warheads and launchers. That would increase the nuclear threat against the U.S. and its allies. China, which has already decided it needs more nuclear weapons to stand up to the existing U.S. force level and those of Russia and India, might well respond to the U.S. and Russian increases by increasing its own arsenal even further. This would put the U.S. back to where it started, feeling insufficient, and facing increased nuclear threats. So we're getting the similar kind of response. The, the Guardian, the British newspaper, had the article that Greg referred to before, titled nine of 12 members of the commission charged with avoiding nuclear conflict have financial ties to defense contractor. That was one that they, a study they did with the uh, Quincy folks. So what this is all saying in part is that the U.S. strategy is so short-sighted that by doing the kind of increase that they're talking about and that Greg and Steve have been talking about would only trigger nuclear anarchy and an uncontrollable arms race. And we know what that looks like. We know that by 1986, the world had accumulated the equivalent of 1.47 million Hiroshima bombs that they had 70,000 nuclear weapons. We're down now to below 14,000. As Steve was saying, that's certainly enough to trigger nuclear winter several times over. Uh, but now they're talking, these madmen are talking about an increase that would only make this uh, dramatically, dramatically worse and increase the likelihood that these weapons would be used. When I was thinking about, about reading this report and thinking about the implications, it reminded me of something that I've seen over and over and over again throughout the history of the Cold War and since. Every time the United States responded to a situation it, and had these kinds of reports, it made the situation that much worse. We can begin with August 1949, and the Soviet test of an atomic bomb, and the U.S. response by deciding to develop 
thermonuclear weapons, hydrogen bombs, which made the situations terrible, ex uh, uh, exponentially more dangerous. We can talk about the U.S. proposal for NSC 68 in 1950, which they didn't think they could get through until the Korean War started. And what did NSC 68 do? The same kind of thinking that's involved in this report, worst case scenarios, not based on what your uh, enemy, your uh, uh, opponents are likely to do, what they're capable of doing in the worst case scenario. Not a rational response, but a worst case numbers response. And so that's what NSC 68 drafted by Paul Nitzer did. And as a result of that, in 1951, the US increased its military spending from $13.5 billion all the way up to $48.2 billion within one year. That's the kind of logic that we see here. We, the we, next example is the response to Sputnik in 1957. The US had a report, another report like this one called the Gaither Report. And the Gaither Report said that by 1959, the USSR may be able to launch an attack with ICBMs carrying megaton warheads against which the Strategic Air Command will be almost completely vulnerable under present programs. We talked about the missile gap, and now the United States is vulnerable. The Washington Post article about the Gaither Report said, the still top secret Gaither Report portrays the United States in the gravest danger in its history. It portrays the nation moving in frightening course to the status of a second-class power. It shows an America exposed as an almost immediate threat from the missile-bristling Soviet Union. It finds America's long-term prospect one of cataclysmic peril in the face of rocketing Soviet military might and of a powerful growing Soviet economy and technology. To prevent what otherwise appears to be an inevitable catastrophe, the Gaither Report urgently calls for an enormous increase in military spending from now through 1970. Again, just like this report, this scaremongering, playing upon fear to, in order to induce a massive increase in military spending, and in this case, in nuclear, uh, in a nuclear buildup. We have the same thing, then Kennedy gets elected partly based on the missile gap, finds out very quickly, not only there's no missile gap, but there is one in the US favor. Uh, but it, by that point, the Air Force had demanded the US employ 3,000 more ICBMs. Strategic Air Command wanted 10,000 more ICBMs, even though the Soviets had a total of four at the time. So McNamara decides that the lowest number he can get away with is by increasing US ICBMs by 1,000 and announces that. Well, how does that look in the Kremlin? They knew that the US already had between a 10 to one and a 100 to one advantage in, in nuclear weaponry and delivery systems. And so they see this and they interpret it exactly as you would expect, that the US is preparing for a first strike to wipe out the Soviet Union. Why did they put the missiles in Cuba? Not only to deter a U.S. invasion of Cuba, to overthrow Castro, but to begin to redress this imbalance and take away this risk of a first strike. Uh, I mean, we can look at others. I've got a long list of them. I just came up with a few minutes ago. The next one I was going to talk about was Team B that overthrew the CIA estimate of the Soviet actual capability uh, in 1979 by Richard Pipes, Paul Nitzer, Wolfowitz. Uh, then we've got the Carter Doctrine uh, and the supposed Soviet plans to take over the Middle East and the Persian Gulf. Then we've got Reagan and the Committee on the Present Danger. Reagan brought in more than 50 advisors from the Committee on the Present Danger. And even though the US was far ahead of the Soviets, he says, we're in greater danger today than we were the day after Pearl Harbor. Our military is absolutely incapable of defending this country. So what does he do? By 1985, he increases U.S. defense spending by 51% over 1980 expenditures. How does he get the money? He transfers $30 billion from uh, domestic spending to military spending. 
uh, overall a $70 billion transfer, uh, 30% cut in domestic spending, a $70 billion transfer. We could go on. Uh, the, but the recent example that you all remember is the Project for a New American Century, which was founded by Crystal and Kagan in 1997, and that produced that report that you all know, Rebuilding America's Defenses in, 19, in 2000, which said that the process of the need for this massive buildup in America's defenses, because we're so weak, uh, it said the process of transformation is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. Well, we know we got our new Pearl Harbor on 9-11, which is a very important cautionary tale because the American people do not want to see the kind of, of military spending increase that's being called for in the Strategic Posture Commission report. And so we have to keep our eyes open because they're going to use any excuse uh, in order to in order to uh, to justify that kind of massive increase in defense spending. This, this report says it has no place for arms control, no place for diplomacy. All they want is this kind of increase. And that kind of increase makes the United States and the world so much more dangerous. It's going to lead to that kind of nuclear arms race. Now that New START treaty is no longer going to be in effect in less than two years, in less than three years, and that there's going to be no nuclear arms uh, scaffolding or architecture to limit the increase in nuclear arms spending on all sides. And so we're at a crucial moment, partly because we're already almost at war with the Russians over Ukraine, because the threat of war over Taiwan especially is so great. And now the situation in the Middle East could spiral out of control overnight. And so we're at a very, very dangerous, precarious time in history. And you've got these kinds of people, bipartisan, Democrats and Republicans. And you know that the Biden's not going to want to look weak and Congress is not going to want to look weak. And so with all these hawks uh, in control now, we're at a very, very dangerous moment. And we've got to understand what we're facing and resist in the way that Greg and the folks in Los Alamos have resisted other efforts to uh, increase the nuclear arsenal and to uh, make this a, a more dangerous situation. Thank you.